Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Elm Parish Church this morning. My name is Gary Smith, one of the members here. I'm going to be leading the, through the service this morning. As you may know, Alistair is on holiday, so we're wishing him and his family well this week um, as they're off. Later on, we've got Corey, who's going to be speaking to us. We're starting a new series this week on heroes of the faith. So we're looking at modern day heroes of the faith, not necessarily biblical characters, but people in the 21st century, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but hero, modern day heroes of the faith. So today we're going to be looking at Jackie Pullinger and wasn't somebody that I'd heard a lot about. So I decided last week that I would watch a video on YouTube about her and she's got a remarkable story to tell and had a very interesting testimony. So looking forward to hearing what Corey's going to say later on about that. Let's start our service uh, with a word of prayer. Let's, let's pray. Lord, we come to church this morning as a collection of individuals. Maybe we skipped out of the door, maybe we were rushing out of the door, or maybe we were even dragged along. Whatever our situation, we pray that you would speak to us this morning, that we may encounter your great love for us. May we be inspired by hearing the testimony and the work you have done in others' lives. May you unite our voices in worship this morning and may it be a pleasing sound to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our first song today is hymn number CH, oh, CH4213. So 213 in the hymn book, and it's new every morning. So hand over to the band, and we'll stand together after the introduction. Let's pray as we dedicate the offering. Lord, we thank you for all the gifts and talents that you have given us. During these difficult times, with the cost of living crisis, help us to remember to be generous with, those, with what we have and to share with those less fortunate than ourselves. We thank you for the food on our tables and the roof over our head. Help us to use what you have given us wisely as we seek to do your will and sharing your love and provision with the people of Ellen. <coughs> Amen. So Eddie is now going to come and give her a kid's story.
Can I regret that? This gives me an opportunity to tell you how much that I love Ron Mackey. <laughs> and I do, I just love Ron Mackey. Right, for all us kids. Hello, you coming? You sure? That's all right. Come on, have a seat. Down in the well, down in the well, deep down in the well, deep down in the well, very bottom of the well, there was no water. But down in the well, deep down in the well, deep down in the very bottom of the well, there were spiders and slugs and slithering snakes, slithering snakes. And the prophet Jeremiah. Oh yeah, sorry, and the prophet Jeremiah. What was he doing in the well? Deep down in the very bottom of the well. He was waiting, that's what, and wondering, and wishing for someone to pull him out. God had whispered in the prophets here, you see, and Jeremiah had passed the message on to the king. Change your ways, do what's right, or I will let your enemies, the Babylonians, conquer your country and turn your people into slaves. Not very nice. The king did not want to hear the message, and he didn't want anyone else to hear it either. So he had God's messenger, poor Jeremiah, dropped down in the well. Deep down in the well. Deep down in the very bottom of the well. It was dark down there, too dark for Jeremiah to see. But it wasn't too dark for God. He saw Jeremiah brush a spider off his face. He watched as a snake slithered closer. <laughs> and then God did something. He whispered into the ear of one of the king's servants, a man called Ebed Melech, and he told him to go and fetch his dirty laundry. Down in the well, deep down in the well, Deep down in the very bottom of the well dropped Ebed Malek's laundry and it landed right on Jeremiah's head. Hey, followed the prophet, what's this? My clothes, said Ebed Malek. Everything but what I am wearing on my back, I've tied them together like a rope. Now wrap them around you quickly and I will pull you out. And so, more determined ever than to pass on God's message, the prophet rose up from the well, right up from the well, right up from the very bottom of the well. Did you like that? He was down in the bottom of the well, very, very bottom. But someone came to help him with God's message, with God's help, and rose up. Will we say a little prayer? Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for this chance to come and worship, to be with our families, to be with our friends, most importantly to be with you. And we understand that when we are down in the well, deep down in the well, deep down in the bottom of the well, all we need to do is raise our eyes and our hearts and speak to you, and you will send us your grace. Amen. Right, now, we are going to say the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to wait for it to go up there. And then I'm going to put this down. And we'll all and say it nice. Can you see it? We'll all say it nice and loudly together. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day. Now the band are going to play Bad Times Won't Last.
continue in our worship singing together hymn number 247 in the hymn <coughs> Moved by the Gospel. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 28, reading verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Amen. Hello, everybody. <laughs> For those of you who don't mean, know me, my name is Corey Manon, and I'm just some chap who goes to church here. Um, Alistair asked me to come and share with you today, as you know, Jackie Pol Pollinger's life. But before we get into that, let's pray. Well, Father, thank you for another beautiful day that you've given us, a day that we get to come and worship you together and look at Jackie's life. So please inspire us and challenge us um, as we look at her faith in you. And please grow our faith as a result. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Gary said, we're beginning a series on heroes of the faith. And uh, I guess I get the honor of being the first one. Uh, so we're here today, Jackie Pullinger. 
she's a hero of the faith. She's, excuse me, she's not considered a hero of the faith because she did loads of huge things and acts in God's name. Rather, she is a hero of the faith because she did one very simple, albeit very uh, difficult thing in the name of God. And I'll tell you what that was in just a bit. But I want to I want to begin with telling you about how Jackie uh, became a missionary and what she did. And actually, has, has anyone ever heard of Jackie Pollinger before today? Okay, I'll be honest. I'm like Gary. I did not hear about Jackie Pollinger before Al- Alistair asked me to um, come and share her life with you. Uh, but he gave me this book. Oh, sorry, Ian, if you could go and put up the slide of Jackie. Maybe? Oh, there, yeah. I forgot that, I forgot that projector's not working. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, this is one of the books she wrote called Chasing the Dragon. Uh, very good read. Uh, I'll be honest, again, I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing. But I, I was able to read enough to where I could kind of suss out what Jackie was all about and learn a bit about her life. So, uh, it, but the book is all about her ministry in, inside the walled city, which is inside Kowloon City in Hong Kong. Uh, <clears throat> you can put that, that next slide up of, of Jackie so we can actually get her. There we go. That's Jackie Pollinger. Uh, so, let's get to know Jackie Pollinger, shall we? And her road to becoming a missionary. So Jackie was born in 1944, and she grew up in Sutton, just outside of uh, London. And she grew up in a Christian home. Her parents were very devout followers of Jesus. And Jackie was not the typical child. At the age of four years old, she realized that she wanted to follow God. Now that in itself is not that remarkable. There's loads of four-year-olds who decide that they want to follow, follow God and give their lives to Jesus. But Jackie, at four years old, also realized that one day she would have to give a reckoning for everything she did. She knew that she was going to stand before God one day and make an account for all her actions and deeds. That, I think, is a bit more amazing. Reckoning for all your deeds is a very grown-up thing to do. I don't know about you, but when I was four years old, I was thinking about candy and toys and things like that, (laughs) not what was going to happen to me after I died, and making it a reckoning for all my deeds. Well, then at five years old, Jackie knew that what she wanted to do when she grew up. Again, okay, that in itself is not too spectacular, because most five-year-olds have visions of grandeur of being, well, at least in the United States, they want to be firemen and doctors and you know, police officers and things like that. But when she was five, a missionary came to her Sunday school class and spoke to them. And this missionary, she went around to every kid in the class asking, could God want you on the mission field? Well, Jackie did not have the typical five-year-old response to this. Well, doesn't God want everyone on the mission field, she thought. So it was then that Jackie Pollinger decided she wanted to be a missionary. Five years old. She was also apparently a a real planner. Because after her confirmation, and still at a young age, Jackie began writing to missionary, to a missionary organization, because she wanted to start the process of getting ready for going on the mission field. And what's great is the missions organization wrote back, and they started corresponding over the years. Well, after secondary school, Jackie went on to Royal College, uh, to the Royal College of Music. And by that time in her life, unfortunately, she had kind of actually stepped away from worshiping God. Uh, But I'll say this, after reading the book, I think it might have partially been because she didn't have Christians that she really at the university where she really felt like she fit in with them. Um, uh, She saw the Christian group on campus and decided they were a bit, I'll use the word stale. That's my word, not hers, just so you know. Yeah, (laughs) a bit stale is is the way I would just describe them from from reading the book. And to be honest, it is difficult 
when you don't have other people to worship with, that you feel like you can worship with them, it's difficult to, to continue worshiping God on your own, um, which is part of the reason, I think, why we have the church, so we can worship together. But that's a whole other sermon. But then Jackie was invited to a Bible study in her hometown. So she went and found out that they were normal people. They talked about normal things like cars and um, clothes and things like that. And they loved Jesus. They loved praying. They loved studying the Bible. And it was there that Jackie renewed her relationship with God and decided that she was definitely all in. And while attending these Bible studies, she came to a realization. Jackie realized that even though she was going to heaven, there were lots and lots of people who weren't going to heaven because they had never heard about Jesus. She sat with this thought for some time about other people not going to heaven. And after getting her degree, Jackie got a job teaching music. And that's when the desire to be a missionary returned, this time in full force. So Jackie wrote to loads of schools and other organizations around Africa, asking if they, could, uh, if they needed music teachers. But unfortunately, every one of them responded that they needed English and maths teachers, didn't need English teachers, at least not at that time. Well, from studying the Bible, Jackie knew that all she had to do was trust and that God would lead her. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed about where God wanted her to go and what God wanted her to do. But it just didn't seem that God was telling her where to go or what to do with her life. And the only advice she ever got from other people when she asked them was, well, have you prayed? And of course, her response was, yeah, of course I've prayed. She didn't find that advice very helpful, obviously. But then one night, Jackie had a dream about looking at a map at Hong Kong specifically. And she wrote, so she wrote a, to the Hong Kong government asking if they needed music teachers. But they they too, just like all the organizations in Africa she wrote to, said that there was no positions for teachers open. So Jackie was disheartened, but not deterred. She continued to pray for God's guidance as where to go, and yet she still did not receive an answer. One day she was invited to a prayer meeting. So Jackie went, hoping that God would just come out and tell her, Jackie, you need to go here and be a missionary in this area. But guess what? It didn't happen. God didn't just come out and say, Jackie, I want you to go this place. But what did happen after the prayer meeting, though, was Jackie came away more convinced than ever that God wanted her to go and be a missionary and that God would guide her. So she made a very bold move, and she quit all her jobs. She w that way, she could be ready as soon as God told her where to go. She could just go. But that didn't happen. God didn't tell Jackie straight out where to go. So she continued to wait. Until one day, while Jackie was helping at her local parish, she decided to ask the minister for advice. And Jackie told him all about um, how she was convinced God wanted her to be a missionary, but that she had waited and waited and prayed and prayed, and God just hadn't told her where to go yet. The minister, his name was Richard Thompson, gave Jackie some of the best advice I think any of us could receive in that kind of a situation. And actually, I want to read, I want to read uh, this sections of this interaction that she had with, with Richard Thompson. So she's told him everything and that she's waiting for God to tell her where to go. This is what she wrote. Richard's reply was extraordinary. Well, if God is telling you to go, you had better go. Well, how can I? I don't know where to. All my applica applications have been rejected. Well, if you tried all the conventional ways and missionary societies and God is still telling you to go, you had better get a move on. 
I feel Jackie's sentiment. I was frustrated. <clears throat> if you had a job, a ticket, accommodations, a sick fund, a pension, you wouldn't need to trust him, would you? Richard continued. Anyone can go that way, whether they are Christians or not. If I were you, I would go out and buy a ticket for a boat going on the longest journey you can find and pray to know where to get off. <clears throat> you can't lose if you put yourself completely in God's hands, you know, Richard continued, and he was quite serious. If he doesn't want you to go on the ship, he is quite able to stop you or to make the ship go any in the, anywhere in the world. Maybe you will go all the way around the world just to talk to one sailor about Christ. Or maybe you will go as far as Singapore and play the piano for a week of youth meetings and then come back. Richard's advice was extraordinary, but completely wise. He never suggested that I had to achieve anything at all. I had simply to follow wherever God led, and I too felt I could not lose on an adventure with God. You see, pretty good advice, I think, right? But that's exactly what Jackie needed to hear. And this is where she performs her one very simple but very difficult act of faith. Jackie decided to just go. She took Richard's advice. She packed her bags, gathered up all her money, and bought the cheapest ticket with the most stops between France and Japan. And she just trusted that somewhere along the way, God would say, yeah, this is where you need to get off. <clears throat> so she was leaving. She was leaving behind everyone she knew, everything she ever knew, and going. So talk about a leap of faith, right? And God did show Jackie where to go. A month later, when the boat came ashore in Hong Kong, Jackie got off. All she had to, with her was her suitcase and six pounds. No place to stay, no contacts, no job, nothing. All she had, oh, excuse me, but Jackie knew that she was exactly where God had wanted her to be. Now I want to take a step aside here <clears throat> uh, because Jackie's story reminded me of another story that should be quite familiar to you. It's a story from the Bible about a man who God told, go, and I will show you where to go. And you've probably guessed who it is by this point, but I'll read the story. This is Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, through chapter 12, verse 5. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abram, Nahor, both married. The name of Abram's wife was, was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. And Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. And the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 year, years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Light, uh, Lot, all his possessions they had accumulated, and the people they acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. And you can see the similarities between Jackie and Abram. And remember that Abram was later renamed Abraham by God. So God told Abram that he needed 
needed to go and that God would bless him and that he would be a blessing to others. And the whole world would actually be a blessing through Abram. And God didn't just come out and say it, but it's kind of implied for Abram to receive these blessings that he was going to have to trust God. And Abram did trust God. He left behind everyone except his nephew Lot and his family and everything he knew to go to a place where God was going to show him. And if you read through Abram's story, you see that while he remains faithful and, he, and as long as he trusts God, he is blessed and the people around him are blessed. And wouldn't you know it, the same was true for Jackie Pullinger. She found herself at the walled city that's inside Kowloon City in Hong Kong. Now, so you know what Jackie was kind of getting herself into. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the walled city. Um, if you want to go and put up the next slide. There we go. Now, it's kind of hard to see with the light. But this, this is a photo of the walled city. Can you see it? It's kind of the really tall buildings right in the, in the middle there. This is from 1989. <clears throat> now, it looks like a decent-sized city, but it's only about six and a half acres, or 26,000 square meters. It's not that big. So kind of think of an area this size, oh, maybe roughly the size of like Tesco and the car park and the petrol station and maybe the, um, the park and ride, the bus stop up there. Maybe a little bit bigger than that, you know, six and a half acres. And uh, uh, go ahead and actually, as you can see, the, the buildings are pretty, pretty tight together, right? Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, guys. So this is a side view of the buildings, right? And there's people, you can see the, the football goalposts at the bottom there. Those are pretty tall buildings. And you may think, how many people can fit in six and a half acres and live there? Well, the population for the walled city fluctuated between 30,000 and 50,000 people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. And there were only a few toilets in the whole place. So sanitation was basically non-existent. It kind of was like several hundred years ago when people had chamber pots in their bedrooms. You know, look out below. So they just kind of threw it out the windows into the alleys. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so these buildings were so tight together that light actually wouldn't reach the ground. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Ian. This is during the day. They had to have lights uh, inside, so daylight just never reached the, the, the ground in there. Um, and this is where Jackie spent a lot of her time, is in these dark alleys. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Ian. This is a photo of Jackie in uh, 70s in one of the alleys. I'll go ahead and go to the next one, Ian. There's a later one of her still there. And so... The walled city actually began as a military out outpost in 19, in, sorry, in 960. And it was owned by the Chinese government until the 1800s when the British government took it over. Uh, there were some contentions as to who should govern the city and uh, provide law enforcement and things like that. Then in the 1950, or in 1950, after a large fire that destroyed a good number of the buildings, neither government accepted responsibility of law enforcement. So there was no law inside the walled city, which meant that the walled city was left open to all sorts of criminal activity, you know, prostitution, child prostitution, drugs, murder, you name it, it was going on. Drug, den drug dens were all over uh, throughout the city. Uh, the organized crime groups known as the triads operated very heavily within the walled city. Uh, gang activity all over the place. And so those who lived there lived in that kind of environment, but they also were, were very poor, which is probably part of the reason they lived there. Well, Jackie found herself in this city, and she found a job teaching music at, uh, and English at a primary school inside the walled city. And she used this kind of as a base for her uh, missionary work, was working at the school. And she even actually attended a church there. 
And at first, Jackie would walk through the city whilst praying and praying for people she saw laying on the, uh, sitting or laying on the, on the ground, um, praying as she walked past drug dens and so on and so forth. And she would talk with people and tell them that Jesus loves them and she would share the gospel with them. But unfortunately, people weren't really responding. And it took some time for Jackie to figure out why. She realized that the people of the walled city were watching her. Not just watching her, but they were, they were watching how she lived. And that's when G Jackie understood that if she wanted to reach these people for Jesus, she would have to practice what she calls the ordinary gospel. Ja Jackie began feeding the hungry, paying people's rent, taking gang members to the hospital after a fight. She took groups of children on field trips just outside the city because they never saw the daylight. Jackie started a youth club for people just to come hang out and have a safe place. And you know what? People began placing their faith in Jesus. Drug addicts were miraculously being freed from their addic addictions. Jackie opened her home to people so they, they could stop living in the drug dens. And more and more people showed up at her door. So many people that her house was overflowing and she had to get other houses from other people to, for people to stay in. <clears throat> and then those people who had come uh, and, and been helped by Jackie then turned around after they put their faith in Jesus, they turned around and started helping other people and get, become off their, their drug addictions and, and leading them to Jesus. And she held church services in the youth club and <clears throat> over the years, uh, they borrowed 287 homes, some, some even offered up by the government uh, of Hong Kong. And as, as, as this continued on and the ministry kept growing and more and more people becoming, uh, kept coming to Christ and, and putting their faith in Jesus, in 1981, Jackie started an official organization called the St. Stevenson Society. And in 1985, the Hong Kong government offered to sell an unused uh, tin hut area to the society, which Jackie bought. And this allowed them to have enough homes to grow and for everybody to be together. And also gave more accommodations and so people could be sheltered and people could come and be healed and worship God together. Well, then in 1997, they bought another plot of land from the government where the society built rehabilitation homes. And these homes, uh, the work of Jackie had begun in the 70s, actually continues today. They have a school for children under, under the age of 18. They have um, job programs. They have, they have uh, again, still the, the drug rehabilitation. Um, and people from around the world can actually come to these, uh, the society and learn how to be missionaries. It's, it's pretty amazing, right? I mean, all of this came from one woman being willing to go. And not only to go, but to go and not knowing where God was telling her to go. And she did one very simple but incredibly difficult thing in God's name, Jackie. She trusted and she put her faith in God. And doing so led her to being blessed far more than I think she could ever imagine. But then that blessing, it led to thousands of people being freed from drug addictions and p putting their faith in Jesus. Her faithful act of just being, um, of just going, blessed so, so many people. Now, real quick, by the way, the walled city is not there anymore. If you want to go to the next slide. In the late 90s, the Hong Kong government uh, demolished it and turned it into a park. Uh, so that's the walled city today. Well, it's not really a city, it's a park. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. That's yeah, just Jackie again. But Now, I think here's where we can be really inspired, possibly even challenged uh, by Jackie's life. And I think like Jackie, 
we tend to get it in our heads that we have to have all the answers before we can go and do what God is telling us to do. You know, we ask questions like, how am I supposed to do that? Or what do I do when I get there? Or even, where do you want me to go? The issue, the issue is, if we had all the answers, we wouldn't need to put our faith and trust in God, would we? So whether God is calling you to do something huge, like travel around the world, or something small, like going and talking to somebody, don't worry about the details. But take a step of faith and trust that God will guide you. And in doing that, you will see the amazing ways that God will work. And sometimes it'll be in amazing ways that you never even thought possible. And so many more people will be blessed because of your one simple act of faith. But doing so, God will work through you and he will work in you as well. So I'll leave you with the words of Richard Thompson. If God is calling you to go, you had better go. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you that we can look at Jackie Pollinger's life and how she put her faith in you. So please help us to follow her example and just to trust you from very little things to humongous things. May we not worry about the details when you call us to do something, but just simply worry about going and being faithful to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Corey, for that. Yes, yeah, really amazing and inspiring that Jackie went to what was literally one of the darkest places on the earth and to, to do that so faithfully. And there's lots of more information online about her story, some great videos that you can watch, or she has her book as well, so definitely worth, worth reading. We're going to continue in our worship by singing hymn number 251, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. Oh, 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 oh. 
Let us draw our hearts and minds together and pray for others. Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you that you are closer to us than our next breath. That you know us better than we know ourselves. That your love for all of us is deeper and higher and broader than we can ever imagine. Merciful and gracious God, we thank you today for the example of people of faith throughout the years who have trusted you and your promises. Those who left their comfortable lives and blindly gone to do your bidding to help those who had lost their way in this life. We know at times that they have risked life and limb to follow your calling to minister to the great need in our world and to bring comfort. Although we can't pretend that we could or would do what Jackie did for many reasons, but we do know that we can do so much more to support international charities and people in our own communities by just stepping outside our comfort zones. Help us, Lord, to reach out to the lonely in our community, those who we perhaps find it difficult to talk to, those who have known addictions and are trying to rebuild their lives, those who may be distanced from their families due to relationship breakdowns, or who are now refugees in our own community. Help us not to be judgmental, as we can't pretend to know or understand what they have been through. Help us to walk beside them on this part of their journey, giving them the time just to speak, listening to what they are really saying to us and how we can help them. Hear our merciful prayer. And gracious God, we thank you for those who supply us with the necessities of life. Especially today, we pray for farmers and fishermen in these changeable climatic and economic times. We pray for fair trading systems throughout the world to ensure that those who produce food are given a just reward for their labours and their communities fed. We pray also for those in our communities 
who struggle to feed their families, especially during school holidays, when children just want to go on holiday like their peers. Merciful and gracious God, hear our prayer. We thank you for all who work in health care, especially at this time of stress on the health and care services. May solutions be found soon to enable the needs of patients to be met while recognising and valuing the caregivers. We pray for all who are ill and in hospital and perhaps awaiting test results or who have to endure long-term ill health challenges. For those who suffer from pain in their bodies and those who suffer in mind and spirit, bring them healing and a better quality of life. Merciful and gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have sadly died this week and have entered into your eternal kingdom. Be with their families as their loss is so keenly felt by them. But we grieve their loss too as dear friends and neighbours. Help us in our neighbourhoods of care to reach out and bring comfort and perhaps practical help too. We ask you, dear Lord, to be with those also who mourn for loved ones long gone but never forgotten. May memories of loving time spent be ever present and your strength and peace also. Merciful and gracious God, hear us as in silence we remember people and situations which are close to our hearts today. As Jesus promised his disciples that he would be with them always to the end of the age, let us as his disciples also renew our promise to stand by those in need over the days ahead, showing our belief through our actions. As Jackie Poulinger said, we need people who will go and stay until the end. Let us be those people dear Lord, throughout our lives. Amen. Thank you, Janet. As we bring our service to a close, please feel free to stay around afterwards for a cup of tea, coffee, a drink and some snacks and have a chat, get to know one another. So we're going to sing our last song, which is called Go in Grace and Make Disciples. And it's hymn number 682 in the book, if you want to follow it there.
Lord, as we go from this place, help us to be inspired by the example of faith that we have heard this morning. Help us to listen to your call in our own lives and to be responsive to that, whether it is to far-flung corners of the world or right here in Ellen. In all we do, help us to remember to love those around us and to show grace and mercy to